And uh, welcome again to my presentation. And uh, I'm happy that, uh, that I'm invited to, to uh, say some words to digital twins. Um, first of all, I want to introduce uh, a little bit my co authors, uh, Rainer Hotline, for instance. The other colleague is uh, unfortunately not here. But uh, we are all coming from uh, Fraunhofer. And first of all, I, I want to say some words uh, to Fraunhofer if this uh, is not really known. I don't know if you know Fraunhofer. Um, and uh, then I will uh, come to the technical tasks or technical task. Uh, Fraunhofer is rather a big uh, uh, society, uh, around 76 institutes, uh, but not only uh, mechanical guys, uh, this is uh, a variety of topics uh, uh, which we work on with uh, 30,000, around 30,000 people, and we have a turnover of around 3 billion uh, euros this year. Okay, uh, and here you can see distribution of the institutes, uh, more in the south, but uh, here in the north, uh, these uh, rather new institutes are more related to energy, <laughs> close to you. <laughs> we have some institute uh, regarding wind energy here, and in Hamburg also uh, institutes uh, dealing with uh, electric uh, grids and power distribution and so on. Uh, as Rainer Nottmann said before, we have the problem that we have a lot of wind farms in the north of Germany and in the south it's more related to solar power. And, uh, but uh, not in all cases you have uh, one of these uh, sources available. And so you need uh, other sources to compensate sometimes and this is a challenge. But I don't want to talk about grids today. <laughs> Uh, these are some um, alliances where we organized in uh, plant and mechanical and vehicle engineering, healthcare, digital economy, and so on. I don't want to talk about all this stuff. Uh, but uh, what's nice, uh, Fraunhofer LBF is uh, active on the main diagonal of this matrix. Um, we, uh, we have uh, uh, focus uh, in the mobility sector um, and also the aerospace industry uh, is included in this and also in the uh, plant mechanical and vehicle engineering uh, um, we have our um, fields. As you mentioned uh, today uh, the vibration uh, solution or vibration engineering is not directly related to one of these uh, sectors. You can apply it here, here, and here, uh, and it's problem dependent, of course. And uh, let's come to the institute. Uh, our institute has a rather long name: Fraunhofer Institute for Structural Durability and System Reliability. And uh, as you can see here, the acronym uh, does not match the name. Uh, this funny, but uh, it's it, uh, earlier, it's founded in 1938, and it called Laboratorium für Betriebsfestigkeit, Laboratorium LBF. Uh, this means that one, but it's a rather old uh, description, but it's something like a trademark, and so we, uh, we uh, had it, uh, oh, that's remaining in the name because it's known. Uh, yeah, uh, we have four uh, divisions, and uh, as you can see here, my, uh, uh, or I'm responsible for the smart structures, and smart structures in this field um, means that we uh, deal often with vibration uh, problems, and we, we solve it sometimes by smart components like sensors, controllers, and actuators. Uh, that we can um, uh, compare to passive uh, vibration measures, uh, we can uh, um, influence these uh, measures during operation very efficiently when we do active uh, ones. But uh, of course, the design of active measures is much more complex than 
the design of passive ones, and so we deal uh, also in the scientific field with uh, these smart structures for vibration and sound uh, uh, problems. Okay. Here's some facts and figures uh, for Farm uh, Forever if we are around, uh, including the TU at Technical University of Darmstadt, we are around 400 people. <laughs> and uh, we have a strong relation to the industry. We have a direct uh, budget ratio to the industry budget uh, of uh, 42%, sometimes 50 But in the uh, Corona crisis, this uh, drops off a little bit. Uh, and as you can see here, we have also uh, large labs uh, around 80,000 square meters uh, where we can perform durability tests and like this. Uh, or other test system test component tests and so on. Okay. Here again, uh, our fields, uh, of course, I said uh, around 70% uh, are in the mobile sector. Uh, but also, uh, we deal also with uh, mechanical and plant engineering, power plant engineering, and processing technology for the industry. Uh, here are some pictures what we do, and uh, uh, sometimes we we also uh, focus um, on yeah no. Let me start again. We normally we focus at uh, Fraunhofer on TRL. It's, you know TRL level for development, technology readiness levels. It's a scale from uh, one to or from zero to nine, and uh, nine means ready uh, for production or uh, product is ready, and uh, zero mine, uh, means uh, basic technology, and Fraunhofer is not doing basic research. Fraunhofer is doing a research from TRL 2 to 6 or something like this in, in the middle of the product development or uh, um, system design phase. OK. Now let's start uh, with the technical content. <laughs> I guess this is more interesting for you. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to give uh, brief introduction to digital twins and what we understand uh, in this field about digital twins because this is a huge word and uh, I want to explain a little bit uh, what's our aim uh, in this field um, and what we want to do, how we want to apply this digital twin and uh, even uh, the name is torsion evaporations but uh, want to include also lateral vibrations in the, uh, in the talk because they are also important but I think it's uh, necessary to start uh, with a smaller problem and not include all these effects uh, at the same time it uh, can lead to uh, too complex uh, problems and uh, we want to start uh, slowly and then increase and uh, enhance the problem or the solving of the problem okay uh, what is a digital twin? Uh, in, uh, in our understanding, a digital twin is a virtual representation uh, of the digital or a digital counterpart of a physical system or a process. We we do not only use a digital twin for systems, also for processes. Uh, this name and uh, in the digital twin, we measure. Uh, data with a sensor uh, that we are able to, uh, to adjust or to uh, improve our digital uh, twin, our digital copy. And uh, what is really interesting that we are able uh, to run uh, simulations on or offline with our digital twin to investigate uh, the system and to better understand the system. Uh, or to mitigate uh, uh, or to, to do mitigations to apply measures to improve the behavior of the system uh, and you can do it as I mentioned before during the operation or uh, offline and sometimes it's better to start offline when you don't know uh, so much about the system uh, and when you develop the uh, digital twin, it's better to start offline 
and then you can go uh, ahead and can apply the system uh, um, in, in the real plant afterwards. When you have developed the digital twin and calibrated uh, the model, then it's easy, uh, not easy, but then it's possible to apply it in the real uh, application. Okay. And uh, what is the goal? Uh, the goal is to generate uh, insights which can be applied then back to the original or physical system. And uh, as I mentioned before, you can do it offline or online. And uh, yes, uh, when we talk about some active measure, we do it online, directly online. When we, uh, when we do model-based control in our smart systems, uh, we use digital prints all the day because uh, we have a model we have sensors and we have actuators, and this is working in the feedback or feed forward chain uh, that we can uh, improve uh, the behavior of a system uh, during the operation. <coughs> Maybe this is a little bit more uh, wider scope because uh, I want to, to show that uh, it's not only possible to use uh, a digital twin in this phase. It's related to uh, to my talk afterwards, but you can also uh, apply a digital twin in other phases of the product life cycle. Uh, for instance, uh, recycling, raw material manufacturing, uh, or our, uh, or also in some kind of redesign phases. If you uh, see that you have uh, some problems in operation, you can redesign. It and can uh, use it here in, in terms of or uh, in order to to accelerate your design process efficiency. The aim uh, for all these uh, digital twins is to become more efficient or more quick uh, or to, to get solutions more quickly running. And uh, what I talk. What I'm talking about today is uh, the operation phase, data acquisition, operational optimization, and uh, predictive maintenance can be applied with this uh, in this operation phase and uh, in the redevelopment phase. When we call it so, a redevelopment, you can also uh, develop uh, these operation optimization uh, procedures in order to. Um, to be able to attenuate operations efficiently during operation. Okay, let's talk uh, about or let's have a look into the operational phase. And uh, when we we have seen it also in the presentation before um, uh, before lunch uh, that we can also do it with, uh, for instance, some kind of this diam. Uh, system, um, but the diam, uh, diam system is not model-based in this case, and we apply here a model-based uh, system uh, or a model-based measure. Uh, we uh, observe something and we analyze, you see, uh, also uh, aspects of the diam here in this procedure, uh, and with the model we are able to predict something uh, what's uh, in the future possible. Then. Uh, we control our, um, our or we are able to control our system, and we are able to update or calibrate the model. That the model it's, uh, uh, gets uh, better and better over time. Uh, and what is also very important, we can or we are able to recommend something to uh, here in this. Uh, in this case, people, uh, and they can change the operation of the system. Sometimes these uh, people are not required, but uh, if you consider um, power plants and nuclear power plants, it's good to have the people in the, in the loop. Uh, a question there. Yeah. I mean, for example, the update of the model, is that done automatically, or is that done more or less manually? Or We will see it. Uh, it depends. Uh, the end game is to do it automatically. Yeah. Yeah, of course. But uh, we have some challenges, of course. And, and we, I will talk. <laughs> we talked about it. 
uh, and yes, we will require data for updating. Uh, when we observe the system with sensors, I will come to this point uh, two slides about the sensors and the locations and so on. And uh, it's not so easy for uh, uh, for shaft uh, to account for uh, places. Then you have to be sure which sensor principles uh, you can use and at which positions that uh, it makes sense to use it. Okay. Uh, if you consider uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, large drive shafts or large power trains, you, you see thermodynamic uh, disciplines uh, or thermodynamic problems, mechanical problems, and electrodynamic problems. But uh, today uh, I will uh, uh, concentrate on lateral and torsional vibrations uh, and uh, what we can uh, or what we have to consider here is vibration responses due to unbalance or air gap torques and uh, stability problems. And uh, <clears throat> yes, of course, uh, also uh, stress strength uh, problems can be addressed by the mechanics or can, can be seen. Um, yes. And uh, as I mentioned before, we have here a, a very complex system with uh, a number of subsystems. Uh, to be considered in uh, in our digital twin, and uh, first of all, uh, we want to concentrate on the torsional vibrations. Even as I talk about uh, these lateral problems too yeah, in my talk, uh, yeah, lateral comes first. <laughs> okay, and uh, as you can see here, you can see a drive shaft with this. Uh, coordinates uh, and the lateral uh, vibrations uh, as uh, output quantities of the system and uh, the unbalanced forces as input uh, um, quantities. And of course, you, you know the uh, equation of motion here. And uh, what is interesting is that for lateral vibration, we have a dependence on the uh, rotation speed uh, for the dumping matrix and for the uh, stiffness matrix due to uh, gyro effects or gyroscopic effects and uh, sometimes the oil fill bearings uh, and some other components um, which have to be uh, considered in the uh, model. And uh, as uh, mentioned in the first uh, presentation, uh, sometimes, uh, of course, the foundation is important uh, to consider. It's uh, for simplicity, uh, rigid here, but uh, it makes sense to consider it too because sometimes there is a big influence uh, on the shaft. Okay, second one looks similar, but now we are here. Uh, uh, we, we talk about uh, um, torsional vibrations, but we have the same uh, equation of motion. Um, we have also torsional vibrations as uh, output, uh, and uh, for instance, uh, air gap torques as input. And uh, here uh, we have um, dependence uh, on the rotation speed uh, in the stiffness matrix due to um, stiffening effects um, uh, related to central Kugel forces uh, on the plates, for instance. And uh, what is uh, challenging the damping uh, in such a drive train is very low and because of that it's dangerous if you have uh, excitations in resonance uh, they can lead to very large amplitudes uh, in, the, uh, in the response of the system if you want to uh, extend something <laughs> okay the general idea uh, is uh, to apply uh, the finite element model of the system of the shaft uh, and uh, run it in parallel to the real system at the end. And then uh, you have uh, here some responses and also some responses from the digital twin. And now you can compare this both. And then you can 
uh, um, derived methods from them. Normally, this model is not really the same like this, and uh, we we have to have a or we have to implement uh, a chance to calibrate the model first before we do measures uh, to control the vibrations, and uh, therefore we want to use uh, observers which are able to collect uh, the differences uh, at certain positions and uh, to give hints uh, how to uh, adjust the model. I uh, brought here a picture of how, to, uh, how we can do this. We have here the real vibrations, we have here the calculated vibrations uh, from the digital twin. Uh, both uh, systems are fed with uh, excitation. And uh, then we use an observer or a feedback controller to adjust the model parameters. Okay. And uh, what we have to consider too is that uh, normally measurement values are uh, um, um, added. You have added noise on the measurement signals, and uh, on these signals, we have it not yet. And uh, that's why it's uh, important to uh, to search for uh, for sensing technologies uh, which have a, a large SNR uh, signal to noise ratio that you have a low uh, measurement noise and that this just don't destroy your your philosophy here and this uh, and this uh, and this uh, difference uh, calculation, but. Uh, here we, we talk about differences. Uh, it's not only we, we um, it's not only differences. Uh, you have you can also do correlation analysis and so on in this uh, block. Uh, the importance is to uh, well, it's important to um, to uh, analyze here. What is really different uh, between these both models? And uh, we have a challenge. Uh, you can only uh, adjust uh, things which are modeled. If you uh, neglect uh, or if you have a, um, a model which neglects some effects, uh, you can adjust as you want. You cannot uh, realize this. And so we have to model the most significant uh, things here in this model uh, that we are able to adjust uh, the model carefully. And now we have a, a second thing. If you consider uh, that the, in the frequency domain the response of the system consists of forces multiplied by the uh, matrix of frequency responses. Uh, the matrix of frequency responses uh, uh, contains the system dynamics, but you uh, you have to know also something uh, about sources, and therefore we suggest to uh, install also an observer for the excitation that you can uh, um, divide uh, which effect is coming from the excitation side and which effect is coming from changes of the system parameters or uh, from changes of the system itself. This is important in our point of view that you uh, see uh, what's coming from uh, from where, because uh, you can also adjust your model when it comes from the excitation side. You have never a chance to uh, to get it calibrated because you have to to see what's what's coming in and uh, what is um, produced by the model. Okay. And Could I just ask you, yeah. how do you distinguish an observer for excitation and an observer for model? This is the question, <laughs> the best question. Uh, this uh, arrow is, uh, is not really right. It should be uh, go into the um, go into the observer, and if you uh, have here uh, an observer. Uh, you, you can do the same for the uh, as you do it for the outputs. You can uh, do the same 
uh, as you do it for the for these inputs. You have to adjust the observer um, in a way that uh, he represents carefully the excitation. But it's not easy. It's also not solved now. Yeah, and maybe in some plants there is a chance that we can measure at the input voltages current, and then to look for the air gap torques. But this has to be solved. Yeah. And, and I guess, uh, yeah. <coughs> uh, and I guess that uh, it could also be happen that we require a model to model the excitation. Sometimes uh, we do it in a, uh, for combustion engines. We do it in, in such a way that we uh, we model also the the excitation as a, uh, a separate uh, um, system because uh, we have changes in rotations uh, rotation speed and something like this, and uh, the amplitudes uh, are not increasing linearly, uh, and this is uh, also a complex dynamic system and. Our aim is uh, for such a system to couple these two dynamic systems. And this could also be necessary here, for, this, for instance, air gap torques. And uh, because uh, if, we, if we do uh, a box about all uh, things related to the digital twin, we see uh, what we need uh, to. Um, to carefully measure things is uh, here on this side uh, the sensor signals from the system, and on this side we need excitation signals. This could uh, be implemented in the, or not could, has to be implemented uh, in uh, into the uh, digital twin. And in this, uh, this is the ideal case, and in this case. It becomes much more easy uh, to distinguish uh, between excitation effects and system effects because we know what uh, is the excitation and we know what is the response, and so it's easier to estimate what's happened in the system. Okay. And therefore, uh, it's also much more easier. Calibrate uh, to calibrate the digital twin, and uh, what we need therefore is uh, we need sensor information from different points in the shaft, and this is also a challenging task because uh, we have different uh, measurement uh, procedures. Uh, we have different measurement uh, quantities uh, or different types of sensors and uh, different uh, sensor locations uh, available or possible locations. And now we have to ask, uh, is it possible to account for the sensor locations uh, at, the, uh, at the drive shaft or not? And which uh, sensor principle is the best to, to measure at this location? A quant uh, to measure a quantity at this location, which can help us if we um, if we want to see um, um, uh, in the frequency uh, uh, in the frequency range some effects, uh, we should not measure in nodal lines. Of course, this is simple, but uh, have to be considered. And uh, as you can see here. Displacement, velocity, acceleration, strain, stress, uh, or pressure are me uh, more mechanical quantities. Voltage, current, electrical, and other physical fields can be helped to uh, uh, to um, to detect problems. And uh, when you uh, use this diam uh, approach, you can evaluate uh, whether if you have different uh, physical quantities what is happening in the system. And then uh, the next uh, is sensor locations. Uh, we require sensor locations with uh, good uh, signal to noise, uh, noise ratio uh, and we uh, require sensor locations 
which are accessible, I mentioned it before. And uh, sorry for this brief or simple example, but I brought a simple example like uh, such a, a, a beam. Uh, and if this beam uh, structure is uh, excited close to the first natural frequency, we see here the first eigenmode, uh, this uh, displacement uh, of the eigenmode. And what you can measure here is uh, um, the displacement. Uh, you can measure it at the end at uh, best, yeah. Um, so I would place my sensor here to measure this uh, phenomena, yeah. To observe the same phenomena with a strain sensor, you have to go here. And now you, have, you can consider which uh, measurement principle you want to use. And the third one, what is uh, important is, is this location, this or this, is this accessible? Uh, and so you can uh, switch the, um, the principle of, of the sensing principle uh, uh, depending on the information to you to require. And this is sometimes uh, underestimated that we that we require a number of different central signals at the right positions uh, to gain the best information calibrate this digital. Okay, I talked uh, about online and offline uh, simulation. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, online simulation means, in our uh, uh, speech here, uh, the power train and the digital twin running simultaneously. It could also be that the power train is only a model in this case, but running simultaneously. And offline simulation means that uh, a calibrated digital twin is used to analyze and uh, evaluate problems. And uh, what can we do with the digital twin? We can do monitoring, sorry, monitoring uh, of the drivetrain during uh, operation and can uh, measure vibrations and can see what's happened. We can uh, identificate, uh, we can do identification of parameter changes related to this picture you can you can see here uh, we can observe this difference uh, now you can also uh, see that there is a challenge come these differences uh, from uh, failures or come these differences uh, from a not uh, adequately uh, calibrated model this is also a challenge And then, uh, as we talked with Powell, the most challenging uh, thing is uh, a thing called lifetime prediction. But in principle, with a, a good model, for at least for subcomponents or subsystems, it should be possible to do also this. Um, as I mentioned uh, in my previous slides, the challenge is to differentiate, to, uh, to differentiate uh, to differentiate between changes of the system, changes, uh, changes of the excitation, and failures. And uh, but if we have a, a, a well calibrated model, then we are able to evaluate vibration control measures uh, and uh, recommend suitable ones for an optimal uh, operation of the system. Uh, for the future. Okay, I will explain uh, the, the aim of monitoring uh, here briefly and the other methods. Uh, we uh, try to measure vibrations uh, by the digital twin and to calculate vibration and uh, calibrate at first the model and then we can let it run uh, and can see what's happened. And then we can uh, come to uh, some kind of uh, decision what to do. And uh, as, I, uh, as I talked before, uh, here we can also apply, for instance, this DM approach. Uh, 
the opportunity that we have with the digital twin is that we, here we can measure only at certain positions, but with the digital twin in terms of virtual sensing, we can account for much more positions and we can see more effects uh, also within uh, the turbines or the generator or some other uh, components. And so we get much more information uh, by means of these virtual sensors. At the end of my presentation, I brought uh, here uh, a simple uh, other example coming from our, uh, from our institute. It's not related to, uh, to uh, power trains, but there you can see what is the, the aim of digital twins and how uh, they uh, can give benefit to, um, to our daily work. Okay. Then uh, the identification of parameters and diagnosis of failures. Uh, uh, we will see this from uh, deviations. If the model is calibrated, uh, the digital twin is calibrated, we can see these deviations between uh, the, um, the measurement values and the calculated values. And then uh, we can uh, use these observers to uh, calibrate or to, uh, not to calibrate, to uh, see um, what is the, um, what is the problem uh, here? And uh, is it the excitation problem or is it a, a problem of the model itself? And uh, examples are, for instance, the increase of air gap torques, then a dumping in torsional system, change of dumping in torsional systems, or cracks or other effects, uh, change of bearing stiffness and dumping, increase of unbalanced forces or misalignment. Uh, and as you can see here, the increase of air gap torques is more uh, related to the excitation and to the dumping uh, and shaft cracks are more related to system things itself or system quantities itself. And so, uh, but uh, in, in my opinion, it's uh, very important to know from which uh, effect uh, this, uh, um, or from, from which, uh, Cause from, from which uh, is the root cause of this problem. From which, yeah. And uh, let me talk uh, uh, as last online simulation about this lifetime prediction. Uh, of course, this is the uh, most challenging uh, task in this field uh, because we we require uh, very precise models uh, to predict the remaining lifetime of a system. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, when we have a look here uh, to this uh, um, procedure, first we have to collect uh, the, the data, then we have to uh, do some procedure like uh, rainflow counting, then we require a reliable uh, SN curve, and then we can accumulate uh, the damages. And the problem is here in this field, uh, normally to get uh, this reliable SN curve, you uh, require tests uh, of, of systems or subsystems, um, and you need a number of systems uh, which you can destroy during the test. And this is not possible here. Yeah. It's too expensive and, uh, yeah, of you course. You have a lot of big turbines in Germany, if you can use for that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> of course. But uh, today uh, you are also able to calculate uh, some, some effects, uh, but not all effects. Yeah. Because of that, uh, we have here the, the most challenging task uh, to, uh, to um, calculate this uh, accumulated images and uh, estimate the remaining lifetime of such a system. This is what, uh, some uh, thing that we can solve in the future, hopefully. Okay. And let's come to the offline simulations. Offline simulations means that we use the uh, digital twin to uh, simulate uh, 
um, several measures uh, which can be evaluated and uh, can be um, investigated without uh, any effect on the real system because sometimes could be dangerous if something is even, uh, also for active systems. Uh, active systems, uh, you put energy in the system and it could be uh, unstable and uh, I don't want to do it uh, in a real test uh, at first. First, uh, for development uh, purpose, we should uh, do it offline. And uh, as you can see here, we have a number of uh, <coughs> vibration control measures available. First of all, this uh, without energy conversion, these passive measures. Uh, this is the conventional solution space, uh, of course, a reduction of the excitation. Uh, then system tuning, uh, stiffening or uh, mass uh, application, damping uh, enhancement, vibration absorption and uh, isolation uh, of sources or receivers. And uh, as you can see here, the field of the active measures is much more bigger and you have much more freedom to do uh, um, things during the operation. You can adjust your parameters during the operation, but uh, the effectiveness is higher in this, uh, the more active the system is, the benefit is higher but also the complexity and the number of variants is higher uh, because it's not so easy to, uh, to handle this. Uh, and therefore we have also produced uh, LBF some software where you can handle active systems uh, in a multi-physical simulation uh, to be sure that uh, sensors, actuators, the mechanical systems, the excitation, and the control systems uh, are running uh, properly in the in, uh, in environment, in the simulation environment, uh, which is close to, um, to the real behavior. Okay. And uh, here, this is illustrated again. Uh, we don't need for this uh, offline simulation, we don't need the real system, we can do it offline. And uh, we, uh, sorry, we feed uh, the, uh, the digital twin again with our, um, with our excitation forces and uh, apply additionally uh, evaluated or to evaluate it we apply additionally uh, these vibration control measures and then we see what's happening and then uh, compare uh, if this measure is uh, suitable or not to solve our vibration problem. Okay. And then uh, I think we have a little bit time to uh, show this brief example. We have a, a testing machine for high frequency testing of, uh, for instance, elastomer uh, components. Uh, this is a, a machine which uh, is able to uh, test in the frequency range from 50 to 2000 hertz. And in this higher frequency range, we have uh, problems that uh, parts of the machine have their own dynamics. And so we have to be careful what we measure and what we report then for our customers, of course. Uh, compared to your systems, it's uh, rather small, but uh, you can uh, efficiently see what we, uh, what we do and how we, um, uh, how we uh, correct our measurement results directly, not afterwards, directly during the measurement. This is uh, enabled by this virtual assembly capability. Okay, let's uh, have a look on the real on the scheme of the real machine. This is uh, written here or depicted here. And as you can see here, uh, you are able to, uh, to have such a, a arrangement. You have a shaker below and a, um, a mass here, seismic mass. And then you excite the a test specimen with, uh, with vibration, and uh, this is a sinusoidal uh, vibration or sweep or something like this. 
And uh, the problem is you have some additional dynamic fixtures here and here, but the load cell is located here. And if you have higher dynamics, uh, this uh, produces uh, dynamic effects uh, here. Uh, and uh, the measurement uh, result of the pure elastomet uh, elastomeric uh, element is uh, not correct anymore. And uh, when we uh, apply such a very simple uh, digital twin, we are able to account these virtual sensors directly at the probe or at the test specimen, and we can calculate uh, during the uh, during the test. We can calculate our uh, right results. And when you have a look here in this curves, this is uh, frequency from uh, zero to two thousand hertz, and this is the dynamic stiff uh, stiffness of the system. What uh, we uh, measure with this machine, and as you can see here, the black curve is without corrections. And the blue curve is with corrections. And in this region, uh, starting from around 1000 hertz, we have sometimes large deviations uh, between measured and uh, corrected or measured uh, and correct uh, results. And when we do it uh, with, this, uh, uh, with this digital twin approach, then we get uh, directly after the uh, procedure our. Uh, Corrected, uh, corrected. It's not corrected. It's simulated, but our corrected uh, measurement results. And, uh, we do not have this. Uh, we do not have to spend additional time and uh, effort to correct these measurement results. And so we can directly perform the project. What is uh, uh, interesting for us, because we uh, have to be uh, responsive. We work uh, for the automotive industry in this case, and they want to have the results. Okay. Let's summarize. Uh, and digital twin consists of uh, an appropriate model of the system, or requires an appropriate model of the system. The sensor principles and locations and uh, a signal evaluation uh, that we can efficiently run this or apply this digital twin. And uh, digital twins are able to support a reliable operation and <coughs> can also be applied to further optimize the system. Uh, as outlook, I propose that we want to start. Uh, the development of the digital twin virtually or offline, because uh, we, uh, for instance, uh, by recorded data of the real systems, and uh, when we have a, a proper a digital twin which is nearly calibrated, then uh, we can go into the real application. And uh, the second thing we want to start first. The digital twin containing, I, want, I don't want to say only, but containing the torsional evaporation and implement the lateral ones later on. Okay. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>